Do you ever find yourself thinking, am I like anyone else? Is there something about me that's different from everyone else on this planet? Do you ever ask yourself that? It's part of the human condition to ask ourselves those questions and to feel different, to play around with this idea of our oneness and the experience of our complete separation. And a lot of times when we engage in the spiritual practice and when we engage in the evolution of consciousness, consciously, we can get distracted. We can have moments of awakening and moments where we fall asleep to where our pure potential lies. In this practice of being human, we have this space where we all have stories. We have life experience, events, activities, goals met and unmet, all of these things that happen to us, through us, as us, however you want to say it. But they happen in our lives. And that's the space where we're all different, where we all have these different stories. And a lot of people focus their spiritual practice there. That's where a lot of their prayer is focused. That's where a lot of their goals are focused. That's where a lot of their resources are placed in those stories and shifting those stories. Now, there's nothing wrong with that practice, but sometimes we come to awakening that that practice is actually not prospering us. It's not actually awakening us. It's not furthering us on our paths. Why is that? I think it's because that practice, applying our spiritual practice to this space in the middle, the parts where we're different, is like trying to change the world of effects. We can't really change our story. We can't change the outside, but what we can change is our perspective and our perception and our practice. And so on the other side of what happens, of all the ways that we're different, if we could all tell our stories in this sanctuary this morning and online, if we could Facebook every little story, we'd have a lot of stories. You might say none of them are the same, that everyone has a unique path, that they're very different. We all walk a unique path. But if you were to look with a metaphysical and a mystical lens, you'd see two things. On the metaphysical side, you'd see that there is a pattern, there is an archetype, there is a theme to every story, something that underlies every human experience, every story. Now, we could think of these as ego experiences, or we could think of them as archetypes, like Joseph Campbell talked about, but there are patterns. Once we learn those patterns, and instead of applying our spiritual fire, our spiritual power to this story, we apply it to the practice of understanding the patterns. We have a key to awakening. On the other side of this, we have what we call in unity the Christ consciousness. In Buddhism, they call it the, Bo the Buddha mind. In other spiritual practices in the general world, they call it enlightenment, awakened thinking, consciousness, right? So when we have that piece, and we start to press our learning into an awareness of consciousness, an awareness of our Christ nature or the perfect pattern of each of us in divine mind, that true potential, all of that invisible, that is the same in every person, we are activating a power far greater than we would experience if we worked here in the middle. So by both activating our understanding and our inquiry into the patterns into the ego nature, into the human condition, and learning from there about the law, about the practices, what practices can I apply to all of these other experiences, and coming over here to say, what is this about? What is this spiritual nature about? What is this sense that I have with all human beings, like somehow we're all connected? Like somehow we're not so different. When it all boils down to it, there are eyes across from me, there is breath happening outside of my beingness, and I, in fact, am not separate from anything around me. In fact, if I wanted to separate from, from that, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to pull myself away from everything around me, because, in fact, I am being lived here, as each one of us are. When we go to those places, we shift our perspective, and we start working with our true creative power, because we're working with the pattern and the law and we're working with the Christ consciousness, and we express that working, that practice, through prayer and meditation. That's the experiential part of opening our hearts and our minds to saying, what is this? What is this self that is the same in everyone, that is perfect, that is whole? What are these patterns here on the other side? When we do that, we take a look at the story in between 
these concepts, and that story in between becomes less relevant because it's just a story. It's just a story based on time, based on events, based on the activities that come to us in every moment. And we recognize that this part is actually very malleable in terms of how we experience it. That it, in fact, isn't a what is. It's a what I make it. And if I want to change what I create, I have to come to the outer edges where my power lies. Oprah Winfrey was asked about the key to her success. How did she create what she created? Would you agree that she's one of the most well-known people on the planet? Would you agree that she's a, a person of transformation, a woman of transformation? She said, as her answer to that question, that it was reinventing herself. That was her answer, reinventing myself. That she learned the art and the practice of being able to recreate or reinvent herself, take everything that worked, everything that was, everything that is her soul's journey, and reform it into the new, into what's present for now, into what could be in this moment. And to let the past go, let the old go but to look at what I would consider her, her divine nature and the patterns and say, all this story about who I am can change. It can change in an instant. It can change in a heartbeat. Amen? Do we all experience that in our lives? That the moment you think, you know, I can, I can know what I, I'm going to expect in this world. You know, I, I'm, I'm ready. I've got it all planned out. There's some curveball that comes at you, right? And you realize, ah. Oh, I thought I, you know, ate once and for all, but I guess you can't do that. <laughs> I guess you have to keep living. You have to keep reinventing yourself. You have to be coming fully to each moment and stand on the precipice of your life and say, what's now? What is the new evolution of me? And how does it express itself? What does it look like? And without that, what happens? Well, we don't become Oprah Winfrey. Now, what happens is we become stagnant. You've all probably heard the scientists that look at something in a Petri dish, and the, uh, the student says to the scientist, well, how do I know if it's alive? And the scientist says, well, is it changing? If it's not changing, it's not alive. And we are of that nature to be changing and to be alive. In Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and clothe yourself with a new self created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And it says clothe yourself. It doesn't say you will be clothed. It says clothe yourself with a new self. Be able to ideate the new and evolutionary you. We are shapeshifters, we are co-creators. But when we forget this, when we forget about the consciousness and the concept of reinventing ourselves, we can fall asleep to what life can really be. Spiritual teacher Michael Beckwith says, are you willing to break your agreement with mediocrity? Are you willing to break your agreement with mediocrity? Pretty good question. He goes on to say, don't accept the status quo of life. Instead, step into the awareness that there is unlimited potential within you waiting to be birthed. This concept of an unlimited potential, an invisible you that is always there evolving, growing, expressing, wanting space, wanting expression in this life, was also alluded to by Joel Goldsmith in The Art of Spiritual Healing. He said, all you can do, all we can do when we come to this point of awakening that this is ours to do, all you can do is to recognize that you embody all that God is and has. You must not try to get, you must not try to have, you must learn how to let infinity flow from you. Are we ready this year 
Not to get rid of all the goals and the resolutions and all those things, not to stop visioning the future, but to vision it from a higher consciousness, to vision it from a place and a space where we truly believe and we truly act on and practice this knowing that we can let infinity flow out from us as us. We create, we are co-creators, we say that all the time in unity, that we co-create our experience, we co-create our reality. That means that there is a power here in the way my eyes see, in the way my mind processes my world around me. And however I evolve in my awareness of practicing with that power, I can either feel like there is no God and I can feel shut away and separate, like I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying, but there's, there's nothing out here, there's nothing in here. Or I can have a practice, an awareness, a perspective, and a perception that bursts open my heart, that helps me to recognize that I am you, you are me, that there are keys and there are practices on this journey that can awaken my experience of God, awaken my experience of absolute love, awaken my ability to feel unity consciousness and to prosper that in our world. We create through our concepts, our consciousness, and our connections. I'll say that again. We create through our concepts, our consciousness, and our connections. If you think of the concepts that we have as human beings on this spiritual path, our concepts, our beliefs, create our thoughts, and our thoughts create our experience. If those concepts are based in truth and in principle, if they're based in the idea of infinite good, of an ever-flowing consciousness, of the availability of intelligence in every moment, if it's based there, then we create from there. If our concepts are not based in faith and principle, and instead they're based in lack and limitation, they're based in victimization, they're based in separateness, then our experience is separateness then there's nothing that God or spirit or life or love or anyone else can do to you or through you to shift that unless you're willing to take those concepts and lift them up with the faculty of faith to be transformed. Because what is going to come to you has to interact with you and come through you. Consciousness. The consciousness is that awareness of all that you are. It's what you are that you're aware of. It's what you are that you're not aware of. But that consciousness is what I call me, and it's that space where reality kind of seems to meet together and become an experience. Through my power of consciousness, I can shift experience. And then there are connections. Our connections are our unity consciousness. It is the idea and the possibility of trying on a concept that life might be made of divine appointments. That in fact, everything I see outside of me may be for me. Everything I experience within me is for me. And that when we try this on, we shift how we approach life. And we shift the questions we ask ourselves. The question then becomes, if we're aware of our concepts, we're aware of our consciousness, and we're aware of our connection, the question becomes, How aware am I? And how does my quality of life become a reflection of this consciousness, of the perception and the perspectives that I have? The questions we ask ourselves in every moment are incredibly important because they frame what comes next. Imagine driving on a a road and there's a car that comes from the other lane and it crosses over and it's coming towards you or just a little bit towards you, whatever it is, but you're not in the safe zone anymore, right? It's coming at you. So imagine that vehicle is coming out there and then just think about the driver. Think about yourself being in the car or anyone else and think about the consciousness that that person could have at that moment, right? I would say for a lot of people, the consciousness of what question do I ask myself in that moment, the kind of conversation of consciousness goes like this. What are they doing in my lane? They can't be in line at my lane. They shouldn't be in my lane. They need to get out of my lane fast. If they stay in my lane, they're gonna have an accident. 
How long are they going to be in my lane? Wake up, get yourself out of my lane, right? It's all of this conversation about the solidified idea that where you are is wrong, and it's about you. You need to move, right? Who needs to move? They do, right? That's what the brain tells you. Now let's step for a moment into full awareness. If there is a vehicle coming at you, and you're not asleep, and you find yourself having that conversation, is it a wise conversation or a silly conversation? An absolutely silly conversation, because you may have a moment to ask yourself a pivotal question, just like we do in life, in every situation and circumstance. And that question should not be why or a judgment on what someone else is doing that's wrong, or how I can change someone else, how I can wake them up. That question should be, what can I do right now to keep myself safe? Because as much as we may want to judge or talk about the situation, here is my power, right? My power is not out there. And if I stay in that stubborn state of consciousness, that stubborn state of mind, what happens? I can actually harm myself. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, this is a funny analogy, but if you really get into this analogy and you listen to people when you're driving with them, right? or you listen to yourself, or you just view the world around you, this is a very metaphysical example of how solidified and, I won't call it other words, but silly, the mind can be. It is sitting here stuck on, this is not what I want to have happen, they are not right, and you cannot be in this space of processing like this and have your attention on, what do I do to keep myself or others on the road safe? What would wisdom do here? What would love do here? How do I stay alive right now? That process takes a whole nother type of mind. It's a mind that goes beyond right and wrong, beyond you and me, and it looks at the whole situation. Whatever, I'll judge this later, but let's be awake in this moment. We may be able to see that analogy when it comes to driving on the road, but can we see this analogy in our own lives, in our relationships? in the circumstances we find ourselves in? Can we apply this analogy and see where we stay so solidified, so solidified in our belief or our idea or our experience that we stand our ground in it? Stand our ground in it. And we refuse transformation. We reject the principle of harmony working in and through us because we're not asking the right questions. Breathe into that possibility that this week, this month, this year, a blind spot may be removed. That some space or place in my life or in my experience where I was driving my life, the vehicle of my life, holding on tight, solidified, standing my ground, solid, where I wasn't being present to where my power is. I wasn't being present to the transformation shift that I could have. There are subtle patterns to the human condition. That's why it's an incredible practice to study them because they're inevitably the same patterns in each one of us. We practice them and we have different experiences and different stories, different names around them. So we call them different and we feel very different. But we can look at each other and we can look at the world within us and see that there are certainly patterns and when we awaken to those patterns, we transform. The first real key anytime we find ourselves in this situation where we realize that we're stagnant or we're holding on to something or we're not asking the right questions is to stop for a moment. Just to stop and really ask the self, am I wishing away what is? Am I wishing away what is? Is there something that I'm wishing away? If energy is going towards wishing something away, wishing something out of our lives, then you can probably bet that that creative energy, that God flow, isn't being directed into the right question. The question of how can I show up in this experience for transformation? How can I show up for this experience with freedom, power, with light? Look at where you are 
and think, is there anything I am wishing away? Listen to the internal conversations you have with yourself, feelings, self-judgments. Listen to the external conversations you have with your world, with your profession, with your bank account, whatever it is. Is there anything that you're wishing away? And how can you harness your creative power? Because a lot of times we'll set these goals and revolu resolutions, we'll set these moving forwards, but we don't recognize those quiet little spaces where we're limiting ourselves because we're not asking the right questions. We're not seizing the day. Michael Beckwith in his visioning book says this, ask questions that inform your life and catalyze your growth. He goes on to say, whatever the situation, the practice of inquiry is to hold the circumstance in your mind and ask this question, what quality would I need to birth for peace of mind if this particular experience does not change? What quality would I need to birth for peace of mind if this particular experience does not change. He goes on to say, what internal quality would enable you to move forward and move on with your life? By earnestly asking this question, the universe will provide feedback about a particular quality that is seeking to emerge through you. The beauty of this process is that when you shift your attention from resenting to cultivating the emergent quality, you accelerate your evolution. Isn't that what a real goal is about? What a real resolution is about? He goes on to say, you act as a spiritual midwife for the quality that was latent, unexpressed, or perhaps not even a glimmer in your consciousness. Not even a glimmer, because we're standing our ground, right? So how do we do that in our lives? He goes on to say, as you use these tools to shift from the external view of victimization to the internal view of transformation, you will begin to notice a corresponding power shift. You make choices through the power of your expanded awareness, knowing that these choices are a function of awareness and that reaction is a function of unconsciousness. using our power to co-create wisely. You've probably all seen this happen outside of yourselves, maybe not within yourselves, but I could probably bet that it's happened to all of us. There are some situations that we're in that we say, why does this happen to me? And of course there are some things that just happen but there are some things that we interact with and happen, and they actually happen mainly through our perception of them happening. And we find ourselves where we see the world asking this question, why is this happening to me? And sometime we can try on this answer, not all the times, but sometime, and maybe most of the time, we can try on this answer when it's something that creates discomfort. Do I tolerate it? because I tolerate it. Why is this happening to me? Because I tolerate it. A relationship is one of the easiest ways to give this example, right? Think about anyone in an experience that keeps going over an experience over and over and over, right? And it has that victimization role. Well, there are other people who wouldn't tolerate that same type of experience. So we can sit here and we can ask all the questions about the story and go, why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Because I tolerate it. And in that statement lies my power because that gives me the choice, the choice to shift. Another example of how that can come into play is when we look at what we're tolerating or we look, because we all have things we're tolerating, do we not? We all have things that we think are fabulous and then things that we're tolerating. 
But when we find ourselves in a situation or circumstance, we stand there sometimes like we are driving that vehicle with something else coming at us. And we toy with this idea, am I going to get myself out of this situation? Am I going to stay in this situation? Is there anything else I could do in this situation? And all of this creative energy goes into the drama of rolling over the story again and again and again. But can we ask ourselves the hard question? Am I going to change my job? Am I going to change my relationships? Am I going to change my saving habits? Am I going to change my spiritual practice? Am I going to start meditating? Am I going to start praying? Whatever it is, am I going to do any of these things? There are two answers. It's yes and no. But sometimes we stay in that question so long, we lessen our spiritual force, our vitality, and our energy because we're asking this question. We're saying, spirit, spirit, help me. Am I, am I? Help me, help me. What should I, what should I do? And the truth is there's somewhere inside of us where we're driving the truck where we already know what we're going to do. So if you know you're not going to leave your job, if you know you're not going to leave the house, sell, sell something, change a position, whatever it is, but there's some place in your life that doesn't feel fulfilling, but you really, if you're really honest with yourself, all these stories and all this talking about it is just needing to be heard because you really know where you're going or what you're going to do or what you're not going to do. Your point of power is to stand in that and say, okay, the truth is I'm going to choose this. I'm going to keep choosing to spend my money frivolously, whatever it is. So what in that then, if I stand in this space, what's the solution? What quality can emerge in me? If I'm not willing to leave this circumstance, this situation, if I'm not willing to change that, to move to another state, whatever it is, if I'm not willing to change this, then what quality can I develop within this to create peace and happiness here without shifting the outer? It's a pivotal step, and it's a step of mature spirituality and mature practice. Because the childlike mind wants to stay in that place of victimization, wants to stay in that place of, I have no control, there's nothing I can do. But each one of us has the God-given ability to stand in a moment and say, all right, if this, then that, so what is mine to do? Show me, spirit, show me how the unlimited can express. And when we do that, something shifts in this universe because the whole universe lines up to answer the question that we ask or to bring in the resources and the source needed to move forward in peace, in peace of mind. But without that, we see through a shaded lens and we only see part of the visual spectrum of what's possible for us. It's like holding onto the steering wheel and saying we're not going to move. We don't even see the other options. I close with this. You may have seen this floating around the internet. Source unknown. You can see less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum and hear less than 1% of the acoustic spectrum. As you hear this, you're traveling at 220 kilometers per second across the galaxy. 90% of the cells in your body carry their own microbial DNA and are not you. The atoms in your body are 99.999999% empty space. And none of them are the ones you were born with. But they all originated in the belly of a star. Human beings have 46 chromosomes, two less than the common potato. The existence of the rainbow depends on the conical photoreceptors in your eyes. To animals without cones, the rainbow does not exist. So you don't just look at a rainbow, you create it. This is pretty amazing, especially considering that all the beautiful colors you see represent less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. Believe in possibilities. Believe that there is an invisible field of consciousness you can pull from, draw from, activate, radiate with. Namaste.